Prime Minister urges Papua New Guineans to demonstrate generosity. In New Guinea, open state-of-the-art residence. And honey producers competing with imported products. This is the National MTV News with Meriba Tulo. A very good evening. Thank you for joining us for Thursday's news. When government planners talk import reduction, the words conjure up images of large-scale industries and big investment. But Goroka, import reduction is happening in small but steady paces. Farmers are putting spices on supermarket shelves at half the price of imported products. Beekeepers are producing honey, packaging their product and challenging long-held views that Papua New Guinea can't produce its own. Lay Bureau Chief Scott Waide was in Goroka where he met a group of honey producers who have been in the business for more than 30 years. For more than 30 years, Teller Lawyer worked in the public service as a honeybee specialist. His entire career was dedicated to building the capacity of beekeepers in the Eastern Highlands. And while he was presented with opportunities to go into business, he turned them down and continued to work with beekeepers. In 2016, Teller Lawyer quit the public service and in an old government warehouse, he started a small business. Uh, what? dreams ahead uh, you know started to slowly come out and uh, now you can come now with Nassim Lukim and we are into equipment um, production basics now and we will go into. With costs rising it was difficult for bee farmers who import beehives from New Zealand. Taking his 38 years of beekeeping and management experience Mr. Lawyer is now helping farmers reduce their equipment costs by producing the beehives in country. Being a Papua New Guinean, you know, we all have our challenges. And uh, what can, you know, question where we should be asking is, what can I do to uh, help my country yeah? in terms of development, in terms of uh, employment for our people, uh, in terms of uh, income generation? This month alone, his small team of workers made over 100 beehives from local timber. Losaid lo beekeeping. Uh, low M low go in leaps and bounds. It's nearly 40 years, you know. Maybe I will crawl yet. Maybe I will drink so sweet. Teller Lawyer is one of a handful of self taught beekeeping experts in Papua New Guinea. But he says the risk of losing this knowledge is increasing as others like him grow older. Yeah, sure, there are other very, very resourceful people who are out there. All need him government support. Three months blow all, training where only Kisima. Outside Goroka, another beekeeper, Samuel Kuku, shows us how honey is harvested. Mr. Kuku honed his beekeeping skills over the last 15 years and is now an authority on honey production in the Eastern Highlands. Suppose you mean in business law life, you must work hard now. Because government, you know, business law government too. I'm something blow you, yeah. I'm blow you one time of family. Samuel Kuku's income from honey alone has risen in the last three years. In 2017, he made 18,000 kina. For a farmer with kids in university, including a son who's studying for a science degree in agriculture, it's important income. Time me give him now, money me put him inside now, effort me put him inside, so now me, we deserve look see now. And time blah mama's here. In the Eastern Islands, beekeepers are a close-knit community of friends. And while the journey has been difficult, they've found that their strengths lie in working together and getting their products on the supermarket shelves. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Goroka. A 48-year-old visibly impaired man has beaten all impossibilities to achieve his dream and passion to become a teacher. Desmond Bang is a teacher at the Creative Self-Help Inclusive Health Center in Medang. He teaches other visibly impaired children. Desmond joined other people with special needs to celebrate National Disability Day in Medang. This is 48-year-old Desmond Bang. He was a trained community school teacher who had taught for two and a half years. 
At the age of 22, Ben suffered from a disease called meningitis that had destroyed his optive nerve, making him blind. I, I found out that the doctors can't help me to restore my eyesight. And nobody can. I believe only God can. So someone came along and gave me a piece of card that has the caption on it that says, except what you can't change and change what you can change. The first 18 years of his life was a struggle. He had to learn everything he knew again. In 1994, he was inducted into the creative self-help community-based rehabilitation program, a program that focuses on helping people with special needs. I have, I have a dream that I want to go back and teach and I want to you know, further my education as well. I found out that this is the only way that I can help myself. Ben had come to terms with his blindness and has accepted it. He is using his experiences to help other people with special needs. He is able to type and use a laptop just like any able-bodied person. He learned all these skills through brailing his letters. Um, I think with that, that also gave me some empowerment. And then I didn't know a lot of things, but as I got into this new way of teaching, as a blind and a visual impaired, I, I train one person at a time. Ben challenged the able-bodied persons to become an agent of change in Medang. Speaking at the ceremony yesterday, Ben said law and order has become a concern in Medang. He said this problem has also affected persons with special needs who are trying to make an honest living. Walk about Miss Owens and there are risks in the community when you walk about from here. But go here, that Miss Aremos and that lawyer not a problem. He can screw driver and minus uh, toolbox no carpenter and come and run the road. He was part of the other people with special needs, Medang District Creative Self-Help Inclusive Center, Divine Word University students and other partners who celebrated National Disability Day. The week-long program saw speeches, plays and information sharing on the importance of celebrating National Disability in Medang. The program was an initiative of the Medang District member. Matalouis, National MTV News, Medang. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill has urged all Papua New Guineans to demonstrate generosity and sacrifice for the good of communities this Easter. In his Easter message, he extended his Easter greetings from his family and the national government to the people of the country. He also said that the country this Easter should remember those who died as a result of the recent earthquake and pray for the survivors. In a media statement, the Prime Minister says this is the time of the year when we must reflect on the values of generosity and sacrifice for the good of our communities and loved ones. He said when Jesus Christ died on the cross for us, he made the greatest sacrifice. And especially on this Good Friday and Easter Sunday, we must remember the sacrifice of humanity. Mr. O'Neill also touched on the recent earthquake that took the lives of more than 116 men, women and children. He said, we have seen true sacrifice from emergency services personnel, disaster response workers, government officials, workers from private sector and people from churches that have been working tirelessly to bring normalcy back to the affected areas. He hopes this Easter, Papua New Guineans can join him in praying for those who died and the survivors who are facing hardship every day since the earthquake. Adelaide Sirox Kari National, MTV News. Lay police are warning residents and business houses in Lay to take necessary precautions when travelling around this weekend. Lay police boss Anthony Bogambi Jr. said police will be conducting special operations this Easter, deploying units to patrol all areas of the city. This is to ensure people can move about freely and safely over the Easter weekend. Mr. Bogambi is also calling on residents to celebrate and observe this Easter peacefully. Mr. Bogambi says the public should call the Lay Police toll-free number on 7090-3300 to report any disturbances. 
Health Secretary Pasco Okasa says there should be more than 35,000 health workers in the country to serve the growing population of 8 to 9 million people. Mr. Kase said the lack of human resource in the health sector is one of the major problems being faced. The department has rehabilitated and established nursing schools to address this problem. According to Health Secretary Pasco Kase, about 50 to 60 medical students graduate from the country's medical faculty every year. He said the current number of graduates per year is not enough to cater for PNG's growing population. According to the estimates and the plans that we have, we would want to graduate at least about 300 students per year to address the workforce shortage that we have. The Malahang Urban Clinic in Lay serves a population of more than 30,000 people. They also get referrals from health centres in other districts. They currently have 11 staff, five of them nursing officers. On average, one nursing officer sees up to 50 or more patients daily. Sorry. With the kind of population that Papua New Guinea has, we should be having about 35,000 plus uh, health workers for the population of 9 million or 8 or 9 million. According to Mr. Kase, the government has invested into rehabilitating and establishing nursing schools to address this problem. Also reopened some of the close ones like Asopas, uh, Inenga and also Boram Hospital, uh, the one in Arawa also been opened. Lucy Kopana, National MTV News, Lay. You're watching National MTV News. We'll have more after these messages. Don't go away. Welcome back to the news. The continuous power outages at the Bomana Courthouse has resulted in the adjournment of court matters involving mentally ill inmates. 22 psychiatric patients listed for court appearances today at the Waigani National Court will have their cases mentioned next week. This is to ensure that their cases are fast-tracked and the 22 are given the required medical treatment before they can stand trial. The 22 mentally ill inmates are national court remandis who are in custody at the Bomana jail awaiting their trials. From the 22, 11 are ready for repatriation back to their respective jails. Some have been remanded at Bomana for nearly two years. National Court Judge Justice Panuel Morgish says every citizen in Papua New Guinea deserves justice despite their disability or illness. They got treatment, they're okay to plead guilty, then we send them back to their original places and they take <coughs> their plea. Under the law, before a person can uh, plead to a charge, he must have this mental, uh, he, he must be sane. Right. He must understand what is being uh, uh, alleged against him, and he must plead. Uh, if he's got problems with his mind, he's not fit to plead. He's got mental issues. Then, and as judge responsible, he is given priority to the 22 to appear in court, so their cases can be fast tracked. To Laloki, he goes through a process. They give him medicine, and you know, just monitor him. Until and when he is fit to plead, then the doctor will say, this person is now fit to plead. He comes back to Bomana, and then we have, we have him repatriated back to, uh, to where he came from. Justice Mogis explained that any accused person who is arrested and charged should be sane or mentally fit to stand trial. Thus, the 22 have a special case where they need court's direction to undergo proper medical help before they can stand trial. We need to, uh, in total, uh, some are still at uh, Laloki Psychiatric Hospital. Uh, we have 12 here who are waiting to be repatriated back. Uh, I think the two, two needs to be cleared properly by psychiatric. Uh, fortunately, visits are done by psychiatric doctors from Laloki here to check on them and then give up the up-to-date up status to this. Thakla Gunga, National MTV News. Bomana Jail Commander Kidikeko says the stretch of road leading into the prison needs urgent road maintenance. His comments come after numerous concerns on the bad road conditions raised by inmates, correctional officers as well as PMV operators.
This is the state of the road leading into the Bomana prison and the recently established courthouse. For three terms of government, there has not been any maintenance work done on this road. During the rainy season, it becomes impossible for sedans to use the road. Well, settlements, there are, the roads are upgraded and everything is done to standard. But this institution was set up back in the 50, early 60s, or late 50s, 60s, early 60s, and uh, we still haven't developed. So yes, I'm asking if, uh, if there's any way they can help. Uh, they should help. Justice Panuel Mogis, the national court judge who hears criminal cases at the Bomana courthouse, has described the deteriorating road conditions as a disgrace. Five play here and by no come back. Five play here, me place a stop, walk in court. All get the year, me walk in court, blow me stop here. This blow road, you go long up here. And one blood disgrace. And one blood disgrace to me, me like or some of these old members from parliament belong to me. This is a metropolitan jail. You don't need a member belong to NCD or notice on it. And Papua New Guinea, put your money, straight into the road. Long time residents of Bomana say the roads to the jail and within the CS barracks were sealed in the 1980s but very little maintenance work was conducted to maintain the road. Since the 90s, the roads were left to deteriorate to the state it is now, making it an expensive exercise for vehicle owners and PMV operators to service their vehicles more often. While the member for Mosby Northeast and the CS Minister are yet to make a response to this, Families of CS officers, inmates and warders have no choice but to continue to use the deteriorating road. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Keeping its long-time commitment to strengthening the financial sector in the country, the Institute of Banking and Business Management hosted its 64th graduation ceremony today. Since launching the Masters in Business Administration in 2013, in partnership with Torrance University Australia, the third batch of students from this program were amongst the graduates today. The 64th graduation once again emphasized the importance of higher education as well as providing our students with the skill set to make themselves marketable overseas. The Institute of Banking and Business Management along with Torrance University Australia provide Australian standard courses such as the Bachelor of Business and the Masters of Business Administration. Laureate is about um, expanding opportunities for edu education globally and uh, making a difference in society because its view is that you know when people get educated societies prosper and certainly that's what motivates us is to to work with people to support IBBM in this case to to help the um, the students and through the students people um, of PNG to to develop better management and business skills. 75 students from courses ranging from the Masters in Business Administration to the Diploma in Project Management graduated here today. Leon Girari, National MTV News. National airline company A New Guinea this week celebrated another milestone with the opening of a new state-of-the-art residence. The facility will house pilots, cabin crew, as well as contract staff. According to the airline, the facility will enable significant savings on operating costs. It was celebrations for the national flag carrier in New Guinea at the opening of its new residence. The state-of-the-art facility will be home to pilots, cabin crew, as well as contract officers of the airline. According to its chairman, Sir Frederick Raiha, the decision to build this factory was part of the airline's response to difficult economic situations in the country in recent years. Like other sectors of the economy, in New Guinea has endured tough times and they remain challenging. But we saw challenging times coming, and we have taken steps to meet them. This complex, the Prime Minister will soon open, is an important component of our package to remain competitive and viable in tough times. Through the use of their own facility, New Guinea expects to make significant savings on operation costs, much of these associated with accommodation for pilots, cabin crew, 
as well as contract officers. We have no doubt this staff accommodation complex is a valued new asset which will support the airline's operations well into the future. In the interim, this facility will be managed by Coral Sea Hotels, which according to Mr. Fu, will ensure high standards of service, something which the airline always strives to achieve. For an initial period, the Air New Guinea residences will, under the management of Coral Sea's hotel, who will operate the restaurant and other facilities, just as the gymnasium, the swimming pool and the lounge bar. In opening the residence, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill thanked Air New Guinea for having the foresight in building this facility, which he said would assist in lifting the performance of this key state-owned enterprise. I know the airline will continue to serve our country and I look forward to uh, working with both the uh, board and the management and staff. Let me take this opportunity to congratulate you uh, for a wonderful uh, delivery of this wonderful asset for our airline. Uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure today to officially open this Air New Guinea residential complex. Thank you very much. You're with National MTV News. We'll have more after these messages. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas now, there's been a major security scare at Brisbane Airport ahead of the Commonwealth Games. A man has been charged with people smuggling and nine others arrested, accused of pretending to be journalists. Six days out from the opening ceremony, security has been beefed up right across the Gold Coast. But the first major security scare of the Commonwealth Games has actually happened 80 kilometres up the road in Brisbane. A group of nine Indians were detained at the airport last night. One of them accused of trying to smuggle the other eight in with fake media credentials, allegedly pretending they were here to cover the Games. I have talked uh, with the Commonwealth Games lead and there is no threat to the Commonwealth Games. In fact, what you'll see is that the system works. A Border Force officer in Thailand first raised the alarm when the group was in transit. 46-year-old Rakesh Kumar Sharma did hold valid travel credentials. He's the alleged mastermind. He's been charged with people smuggling and using false documents. He remains in custody ahead of a bail application next week and faces up to 20 years in jail if convicted. The other eight face imminent deportation. At the 2006 Commonwealth Games, 45 people, mostly from African nations, tried to stay in Australia illegally. Two of them are now competing for us in weightlifting. But authorities say this latest incident in Brisbane shows that the system is working and should serve as a warning to anyone who tries to beat it that they will get caught. A group monitoring ca civilian casualties in Iraq and Syria has praised the Australian Defence Force after it acknowledged, it acknowledged that an Aussie airstrike on Mosul likely killed two young Iraqis. Much of the nine-month battle to take the city of Mosul from Islamic State was about precision warfare. Now, a case from May 3rd last year reveals how easily it could go wrong. I think what we're looking at here is an extended family. London-based civilian casualty investigators Air Wars reported the testimony of an Iraqi man in a refugee camp, telling how he rushed to the West Mosul home seconds after an explosion. Inside, he found his 27-year-old brother and 20-year-old sister-in-law dead. Two toddlers, his niece and nephew, had survived. They were unaware of any ISIS fighters in the vicinity at the time of the bombing. The ADF insists there were two Islamic State snipers using a West Mosul house that day in the seconds before an Australian Super Hornet hit it with a precision missile. But Defence does now acknowledge the house it blew apart was likely the same one in which the young couple died. We do everything we can to avoid uh, civilian casualties but regrettably in a war zone, uh, casualties of this kind do occur. 
Now, Defence has acknowledged the likely involvement of Australian forces in three deadly incidents. We think it's the behaviour of a mature and responsible military admitting civilian harm. Air Wars makes the point the May 3rd strike shows the limits of precision warfare. The Australian bomb likely struck exactly where the pilot had aimed it. It's just he and his chain of command had no idea there were civilians hidden in their target. NASA has revealed the spacecraft that will soon travel closer to the sun than ever before. Scientists believe the Parker Solar Probe will be able to clear up some of the burning questions we still haven't answered about our nearest star. NASA engineers are putting the final touches on the Parker Solar Probe, the spacecraft set to travel closer to the sun than any other in history. We've had to wait 60 years for technology to catch up with our dreams. Lead scientist Dr. Nikki Fox has many burning questions, like why the sun's atmosphere is hotter than its surface, unlike any other body in the solar system. It's like breaks the laws of nature. You walk away from a campfire, you do not get warmer, you normally get colder. Not in the corona. Researchers also want to learn more about solar wind, which helps predict space weather. Satellite systems are affected by space weather. Energy Energy grids are expected by space weather, particularly the northern latitudes. Trying to understand those effects is, is very important. One of the biggest challenges is making sure the spacecraft doesn't melt as it approaches the sun. Scientists have developed a heat shield made out of carbon that will sit on top and function like a baseball cap. It's just indescribable to we'll see the joy of, of seeing it all come together. Betsy Congdon leads the team that designed the heat shield over the past decade, finding a way to withstand a temperature of 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit. Putting a bunch of different tests that we actually did all over the country together, we can show that the heat shield actually will work and perform like we think it will at the sun. NASA plans to launch the Parker at the end of July, arriving to the sun's corona in 12 weeks, shining new light on a bright star. When it comes to recycling plastic, the Balkan state of Estonia knows a thing or two. They've introduced a scheme so successful, other European countries go there to look and learn. Scotland is the latest at checking out Estonia's secret. This is a deposit return scheme in action. It's been in Estonia for 12 years and it works. 3.2 billion drinks containers have been recycled here. Only 10% of plastics don't come back into the system and the logic is as long as they're in the country's recycling programme, they're not polluting the world's oceans and parks. Now it says that one plastic bottle, 10 euro cents for deposit. And now after giving all the packages, we have two options, to take out the money or to donate for Estonian children and, uh, and culture. One concern is stopping people defrauding the system by returning bottles from other countries. But Estonia has an answer for that. How does the machine identify that this is a bottle not from Estonia? The very Im most important thing is the EN code, but the machine has different uh, security uh, themes. You put it into the machine, the machine tries to detect it in a millisecond, it rejects it, saying that this container is not acceptable, it's not from Estonia. But Edinburgh news agent Ferhan still has concerns about storage. He spoke to Estonian shopkeepers who have to build outhouses for their bottle returns. In my smaller store right now, if I was forced to collect it, it would have to be behind the counter in plastic bags. Scotland is learning lessons from this Estonian model, but recycling the right ideas is just as crucial to getting people and businesses on board in the fight back against pollution. Yeah, with Thursday's news, we go for a break now. When we come back, some sporting updates in Drukai Sports. Don't go away. Drukai Sports. Welcome to Trukai Sports. The fifth day of the 43rd National Game Fishing title saw the Trukai shootout take centre stage. And like all things so far, it certainly was a day to remember. From the shotgun start to where fish finish triumph, here's Judah Memafu with the day's highlights. 
Well, it seems as everything you expect always has a way of surprising you with an unexpected twist. Day 5 of the 43rd National Game Fishing Titles here in Le Morbe province was marked as the Trukai Billfish Shootout. No, this morning there was a lot of uh, nerves around the place, but uh, once we got out on the water, uh, it seemed that uh, the wind blew itself out and uh, it was another fantastic, fantastic day on the water. With a sizable amount of prize money up for grabs, the boats headed out and it was Tammy Island that was the destination to try fortune and favour and make hope a reality. Eight uh, billfish captured today and we had uh, 15 tagged. So 23 billfish all up and well over 50 strikes. So uh, Tammy Island once again, I don't know if that thunder and lightning was its way of letting us know that uh, she's still firing, but uh, she, uh, she came through today. First time on the uh, game fishing rod, so I, I really had no idea what I was doing. I was lucky uh, Uncle Patrick over there pulled in the first one, so I, I literally learned everything I knew about an hour before I pulled it in, so it was a great day for me. I learned a lot. <laughs> no. This isn't the first time you guys probably landed this one, no? It's actually the first time we've won the shootout. Um, we've come second twice, and yeah, it's good to be the uh, bride, not the bridesmaid for once. The reality, uh, Trukai is always uh, there to support uh, community and also the uh, business uh, houses and uh, I don't see any problem why Truka is coming back on because they are a big uh, company in a PNG and uh, they want to continue doing the sponsorship for this uh, kind of uh, game like you know in, in this case a fishing game taking place now. Yeah we've got a couple of international anglers coming in over the Easter weekend there's a team coming in from uh, from Cairns and, and another team coming in from Sydney so it'll be really interesting to see what those those boys can do um, they're both uh, very skilled teams and have fished up here before so uh, it's going to be, the, the action is definitely going to heat up over the weekend, I think. Those scoreboards are going to get very busy. Well, the fishing will continue and day six of the tournament will have its fair share of triumphs and surprises. Judah Mamafu, National MTV Sports, Lay. We'll go for a break now and be back with more of Truka Sports after these messages. Truka Sports. Welcome back to Trukai Sports to some sports abroad now and the hype for this weekend's heavyweight unification bout has arrived in Cardiff. Joseph Parker and Anthony Joshua have been working out in front of the fans three days out from their showdown at the Principality Stadium. A heavyweight championship weighted heavily against Joseph Parker. Everything for the Kiwi is just that bit more low key. <laughs> when compared to his British opponent, Anthony Joshua. <laughs> but all the whiz bang in the world means nothing when it's just two guys in the ring. When I get in there and throw punches and bunches, you know, one of them's going to connect well and hopefully in the right place where he goes down and then I say, thanks for the fight. Perhaps thinking the same, AJ's team were ringside, keeping an eye on Parker's training. And strip it all back, this is how the two fighters stack up on paper. In the Kiwi corner, Parker undefeated, 26 years old, 24 wins, 18 knockouts. In the British corner, Joshua also undefeated, he's 5 centimetres taller, his reach 15 centimetres longer than Parker's. I'm on paper, then Anthony Joshua would obviously be the favourite. He's the unified champion, he's, he's uh, Olympic champion in, in the past, he's had a stellar boxing career. He's taller and he's got better reach. But um, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The tale of the tape doesn't tell the whole story. Both sides agree on that. Away from stats, there's heart, there's chin, there's durability. There's no stats for those. Um, and I think both guys have that in abundance. A lot's been made of the fact that Joseph Parker has never faced a crowd of 80,000 before, but that goes both ways with so many people rooting for Anthony Joshua, the hopes of so many British boxing fans. That is immense pressure. And what happens if he loses? Um, I think he's not going to lose. He's not going to lose. If you dislike him because he loses, disrespectful. Rest in peace to this guy. Him. Him right there. From the mouths of babes, a tough crowd you wouldn't want to let down. This fight is Anthony Joshua's to lose and Joseph Parker the underdogs to take. To rugby and sitting at the bottom of the New Zealand conference after six weeks of super rugby and starting to feel like the same old story for the Blues, which means trying to tell a fresh story about the team is getting harder and harder ahead of Saturday's game against the Sharks. 
Tana Umang is in his third season of facing the same questions. Yes, no, they seem to be the same theme each week with that. Is that frustrating to you? Yeah, it is. Very, very. So, you know, look, you know, we've had to make some shifts to those guys that have got the energy and the attitude and the want to do that. The journalists who turn up every week are sick of it too. Is it frustrating? Riding on the blues? Oh, you bet it is. <laughs> Deja vu all over again. Groundhog day. Recurring nightmare. Yeah, it can be, I think, unless you're a, an incredibly cold-hearted person, uh, you know, going over the same sort of themes and, and, you know, kicking a dog while it's down. The players notice. You pick us this week or what? You and Sav bagging us again or what? Never mind the reports, Tana Umanga is sick of the team's mistakes that constantly feature in them. You didn't see our last game. I did. <laughs> Umanga is frustrated by a lack of urgency and constant errors in a lacklustre loss to the Stormers. So has made seven changes for the Sharks. As ever, first five is the ongoing storyline. Stephen Perifetta is stepping up to start at ten. Standing captain James Parsons thinks taking pride in doing individual jobs well is one key to them finally finding consistent success. Does everyone have that same mindset? I, I believe so, yeah. And it's the right mindset? Yeah. But for the coach, talk is no longer enough. We can only say and, and uh, listen to the words for so long before we see the actions behind it. And that's what we're looking for. The cricket and the three players involved in the ball tampering scandal have been handed tough sanctions by Cricket Australia. Steve Smith is being banned from international cricket and domestic cricket for 12 months and he won't be able to hold leadership positions for a year after that. David Warner has also been suspended for 12 months and he won't even be considered for a future leadership position. Cameron Bancroft carried out the ball tampering and has been given a nine-month ban. Cricket Australia's major sponsor, Magellan, pulled out of its $20 million deal after the punishments were announced. And in a further loss for Smith and Warner, their $2 million Indian Premier League contracts have been ripped up. They are scenes usually saved for criminals. Steve Smith surrounded by police, even manhandled as he leaves Johannesburg. The public jeering, shouting at him. After details of his 12-month playing ban had just been made public. The process that uh, the Cricket Australia Board has worked through over the last few days has been exhaustive to uh, arrive as best we can as a, uh, at decisions that uh, are sanctions that are representative of uh, an appropriate measure given uh, the incidents that took place in Cape Town on, uh, on Saturday. The Cricket Australia investigation also cleared all other members of the team, including the coach. As I said last night, Darren Lehman's the coach. Darren Lehman uh, was not in any way involved in the incident. In his first comments on the scandal, and at times emotional, Lehman says he was as shocked as everyone else. The first I saw of it was on that screen. And I got obviously straight on the walkie-talkie and said something to Peter. Um, and there was a couple of expletives in there. Um, and then I spoke to the players at tea time. The investigation concluded the ball tampering plot was hatched by David Warner. He even showed Cameron Bancroft how to do it, while Steve Smith instructed Bancroft to cover it up. At least they have got a band. That's what I was worried about with Australian cricket, whether they might go light on them, but uh, I think they do realise the severity of what these idiots have done. The report also revealed Smith and Bancroft had lied that it was sticky tape being used to alter the ball. It was sandpaper. The release that's gone out today confirms that it was sandpaper. The coach is asking fans of the game for compassion. There's a human side of this. They've made a mistake as everyone, including myself, has made mistakes in the past. These are young men and I hope people will give them a second chance. Everything that's happened is, has happened. There's no way you can turn the clock back now, so the only thing they can do is turn the clock forward and deal with what's in front of them, deal with the present and see where they go. The players have seven days to accept or appeal against the sanctions. Back home in National Women's Sevens team, the PNG Palais are determined to make the top eight at this year's HSBC Seven Series in Hong Kong. Coach John Larry is confident that the girls will do well this time around. Godwin Eki reports. After playing the Hamilton and Sydney Sevens earlier this year, Coach Larry says training for the Palais have been going well. 
13 players were announced yesterday with the inclusion of Cairns-based Yolanda Gittins to make the final team. Our aim is to um, finish uh, first in our pool. Uh, we got South Africa, uh, Kenya and Mexico, our first game against uh, Kenya. So it's a, it's a, strong, a strong pool. Uh, we want to take uh, one team at a time. Uh, the aim is uh, South Africa is our uh, main threat to us. I believe my girls can do it and we can do it. Yeah, as long as we do the right decision at the right time. The team has qualified for the San Francisco World Cup. However, the aim is to make it into top four. In the seventh circuit, Captain Taiva Lavai says the girls have been training and working hard on areas of improvement in the last month. I'll do my best to uh, take the team down to Hong Kong to qualify for the World Series. It's been good. Uh, Training is tough a bit sometimes, but they're taking along. Uh, they have put in the effort to uh, training drills, especially, and yeah, we're close to achieving what they're aiming to. Winger Yolanda Gittins from Brisbane says she is looking forward to sharing her experiences with the rest of the players. Yeah, I hope to just bring a little bit of um, experience from uh, the coaches that we have uh, in Australia um, and just give all that I can. Uh, where, whatever the team needs from me is um, hopefully what I can, I can provide. Uh, we've done a lot of running, um, obviously contact, we've done a like, pool recovery session today. So um, yeah, it's been a bit of a busy schedule. I usually play a lot on the wing um, and sometimes in the centres. Uh, yeah, but I'm not sure where they're going to be playing me in this team. First time when I entered Palais, I travelled to Fiji for the Oceania 7s. And then this year, January for the Sydney 7s, HSB 7s. And then the Super 7s in Brisbane and then back home. Oh, I feel excited to like, actually make the team because like, every day wake up early in the morning for training and then afternoon again so yeah pretty excited about it. Pretty good I've been learning a lot from the senior girls since I'm the youngest and I've been the, the new in the team I've been learning a lot from them and I feel better around them also. Meanwhile the World Cup Championships will be held in San Francisco USA in July. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. And the Dan Strukai Sports will go for a break. When we come back, the weather details for the next 24 hours. Strukai Sports. Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux, celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. A look at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours in the southern region, mostly fine for Alata. Thundery showers expected in Popandeta, a shower or two for Port Mosby, Daru and Kerma. To the Momasa region, thundery showers expected in Lei, Wau and Madang. Thundery showers as well for Wibak, rain and showers for Vanimo. To the New Guinea Islands region, thundery showers in Lorengau, Kavian, Kokopo, Rabaul and Kimbe. Some showers expected in Buka. And in the Highlands region, Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg, all these major centres can expect some rain and showers over the next 24 hours. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And to end the news, a recap of our top stories this evening. Prime Minister urges Papua New Guineans to demonstrate generosity. A New Guinea open state of the art residence and honey producers competing with imported products. And that has been the news sport and weather for today, Thursday, the 29th of March, 2018. On behalf of the MTV News Team, enjoy your Easter. Good night. <laughs>